you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to join me in the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. Um, a passage of Scripture that's somewhat familiar to us, but uh, I want to give a little historical background for just a moment here. Um, Jerusalem, the, the holy city, if you will, um, sits in a, if you look at Jerusalem and then you look at the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ was arrested, uh, to, to get from one to the other, you have to pass through this valley. Uh, and, and it's not a huge, huge valley, but as you pass through that valley, it is filled with uh, vineyards specifically, uh, and, and it's been always done that way. For whatever reason, that section of ground is, is a good section of ground to grow grapes. And, and as one of the major exports and one of the major products of the, the country of Israel, that area has always had vineyards there. And so Jesus, on the night of his arrest and his, uh, his uh, betrayal and the, the Last Supper and all of that sort of thing, after the supper takes place, he is leading his disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane where they are going to go and pray together. And in so doing, they have to pass through this vineyard. And, and maybe you've heard this before and maybe you are familiar with the story, but in John chapter 15, it is that journey between Jerusalem and that Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the middle of it, crossing through there, we find John chapter uh, 14, 15, and 16, and even 17, and this wonderful teaching that Jesus has for his disciples and for all of Christianity. But not only this teaching, but he prays for his disciples in all of this. And so he uses what is around him, as Jesus so often does, as his uh, visual aid to his lesson. And so he starts teaching to them about grapes. Now, we all know that Jesus isn't really teaching about grapes. He's a carpenter, after all, not a farmer. And so he's not as interested in cultivating grapes as he is in cultivating people. Um, but he is using them as an illustration, and he starts to share with them uh, about grapes, meaning their lives, and what God does in their life as the vine dresser. Um, and so with that background information, I also want to state this. In the Gospel of John, there are seven statements where Jesus gives us a definition of who he is. Um, biblical scholars have called them the I am statements of John. There are seven times where Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the, and he fills in with a descriptor. And none of them are like, I don't know, I am the Son of God, uh, as blatant as that. They are, I am the Good Shepherd. I am the vine, which is the one we're looking at today. And so, as I'm saying that, understand that Jesus is talking about uh, an analogy of who he is in relationship with you and I. Uh, he's teaching this to his disciples, but he's wanting us to understand the relationship he has for you and I as well. But to do so, I think we need to know a little bit about grapes. And I am not a grape farmer, um, have never really grown grapes on my own. My grandmother had a grapevine uh, on the farm growing up, and um, I saw it, and I've picked grapes off of it, and I've eaten them, but I had nothing to do with the care of it. Um, I, I wasn't even there at any point in time when grandmother took care of them. And so uh, I am going to teach you about vineyards and grapes and all of that from a layman's perspective, okay? So just the essentials to what it has to do with us today. Um, but I feel like it's important because here's the truth is if we understand what Jesus is talking about, we need to also understand uh, what is grape culture and then we will get the whole picture. So with that said, really quick, let's fly through this port, part of it. Um, in Hampton Court near London, yep, that's where we're going. In Hampton Court near London, uh, there is a grapevine there, which is about 250 years old. This is honest to goodness truth. You can, if you go on Google right now and Google grapevine Hampton Court, it will come up with this because it is a famous grapevine. Why is it so famous? Because it is the largest grapevine in the world. It is currently the largest grapevine in the entire world. It's 250 years old-ish. Um, this grapevine has one root, and that root is over, are you ready for it, 13 feet thick because of all of the years that it has grown. Uh, one grapevine with, with a 13 foot wide, of course on the website it tells you in meters and then converts it to feet, but it's 13 feet wide for one root that goes down into the ground and gives the nourishment for the entire 
grapevine. And over those 250 years, it has been growing in Hampton Court, and it has this awesome history. Uh, during World War I, uh, they gathered the grapes and they sold them and used the money uh, from selling the grapes to uh, help uh, soldiers who had been blinded during World War I. Uh, during v- World War II, again, it played an integral part in, in helping soldiers out and that sort of thing. And, and over its year, it has outgrown the building in which it's housed three different times. Uh, and so they've had to build a new building over top of the old building and then try to take down what they could of the old building as the grapevine has uh, come in and around it. But out of this one grapevine with a 13-foot thick uh, root, there are some branches of that vine that are over 130 feet long. Now, that's, that sounds all fine and dandy. I'm just throwing numbers at you. But if you can picture 130 foot long, there's not many plants in our culture here that go from here to 130 feet there and are all part of one plant. It's pretty impressive. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, this, this vineyard or this vine, I should say, in Hampton Court, uh, on average, every single year uh, for its harvest produces, on average, 600 pounds of grapes per year. And as much as 845 in one year, in 2001, it's, it's high watermark of, of grape production at this point in time, uh, it produced that much. And although some of the smaller branches are 130 feet away from the source of its life, that, that one root in the middle, they still bear the sweet and delicious fruit because they are connected to the vine. And that's the important part of this whole thing with this, this, vin, this vine, this grape vine in, in Hampton Court and this understanding of what Christ is teaching to his disciples as he leads them to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is talking to them about grapes, but he's really talking to them about being connected to the source. And that's where it's all at. Life flows from that single root to all of uh, the vine uh, branches and shoots and everything else, providing the nourishment and the strength for each of those branches to produce a fruit. And Jesus, he, he understands this culture and he starts to teach his disciples about that. And let's just take a look at what he teaches about it for just a minute. Beginning in John chapter 15, verse 1, we read, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you, and so remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and it withers and dies. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. Father God, I just pray that you would open your word to us, that we can hear from you, that we can hear your truth. God, that you would challenge our heart, mind, and soul to grow close to you and to lay aside anything that would get in the way from pleasing and honoring you through our life. And God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the vine, the source of our, uh, of our everything. God, the source of our salvation the source of our freedom. And so, God, I thank you for your son who willingly came and died on a cross for us and took our sin to that cross. And God, even more than dying, God, you raised yourself again. And you did that so that we would know who you are, that you could complete the work in us of creating new life. So, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would have freedom in this place that every man, woman, and child here would seek you first, your kingdom, your righteousness, and let everything else be added. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So when Michelle and I bought the house that we currently own, it was May of 2018, and we bought this house, and we were pretty excited to be moving closer to Mount Pleasant for obvious reasons, because then we could be close to you guys, right? 
That's, that, that excited us. We were excited to be up here and in the culture and in this community. It was an added bonus that as the spring turned into early summer, uh, we noticed that a lot of the trees on the property, which we had not even paid attention to when we were buying it, uh, started blossoming and producing cherries. Uh, we have six cherry trees currently that produce a ton of cherries. And every year we keep asking people to come out and pick cherries And typically about half of them end up on the ground anyhow because not enough people can keep up with six cherry trees, it seems. We also have had the luxury of having uh, these these vines in the back that produce black raspberries. And we have two apple trees on the property and three pear trees on the property. Now, Michelle and I, neither one have grown up um, raising fruit. Uh, And so it seems a little foreign to us that we have fruit all of a sudden. And then it's not because of our labors, mind you. It's just there. It was growing years before we ever owned the place. This year, we had so much fruit. It was just a great year for it. My wife picked over five gallons, uh, bags full of, of uh, black raspberries. Uh, we had buckets and buckets and buckets of cherries and uh, pears and all of that sort of thing. And right now, we have a tree that is so loaded with red apples. Anyone's welcome to come pick them, by the way. Um, and it's just crazy. But midway through the summer, and I'm telling you all of this because of this, midway through the summer, I was walking through the raspberry section, uh, black raspberry section, and I was trying to make it so that we could get to them easier and mowing some path uh, through there. And I noticed these dark objects off to the side. And so I stopped and I looked. We also have a grapevine now growing in our backyard that I'd never noticed before. And I asked Adam, the previous owner, and he didn't even know it was there. But we have a grapevine growing out of the backyard uh, area, uh, just maybe 30 feet away from our back porch. And there are grapes. Now they're tiny, and and, and they they don't look very healthy. And so I was looking at it, and I realized the reason that they're so tiny and the reason that they don't look very healthy is because they have never been tended. Like I said, the previous owner living there uh, for years and years didn't even know they existed. They were buried amongst the other trees and foliage. And and so there we have this now newfound fruit patch. But here's the thing. It's worthless to us in its current state because the berries aren't big enough to produce any kind of uh, of value. And so if Michelle and I were wanting those grapes to become something that we could harvest like the raspberries and like the pears and like the, the cherries and all of that sort of thing, what needs to happen is I need to take the time to go out there and to trim around them and to actually trim them, to trim the vine itself so that it can produce greater fruit. Now, I haven't yet decided if I'm going to do this, by the way. I'm just throwing it out there because uh, it's our situation that we're in. And this is a good illustration for this simple truth. In our lives, if we want to play into this illustration that Christ gives us in John chapter 15 of we are, the, we are the branches of this great vineyard. And if we want to look into this, what we can see is that it is really easy for us to understand that our lives can run a certain course that is unhealthy while maintaining an image of health. There are still grapes on that vine, though they are so small that there's more seed in them than fruit. And our lives can look a certain way and we can go a certain direction left to our own devices. But until we allow uh, the, the vegetation around us to be pruned away, until we allow ourselves to be pruned and cut into the right mold that God would want us to be, until we allow the nutrients to flow freely, uninhibited to our very souls, then we will never produce the fruit in which God has intended for us to produce. There are some simple truths about grapes that uh, play into all of this. And as I already pointed out about this one huge vine in in London that has been there for so long and has produced so much, understand that there is so much more to this this grape culture. Grapevines would rather produce shoots. This is a truth, by the way, that I have discovered in my looking at grapes now. Uh, Grapevines would rather produce shoots and leaves than they would grapes. That doesn't seem to make sense in our culture, but that's actually the truth of what a grapevine does. They produce a lot of shoots and leaves, but not so much the fruit. This is the natural way that they are designed. The fruit is, is only the seed that passes on and makes them grow and, and, and into new plants, which is essential. But rather than having a lot of that, the natural of the plant is to protect the little bit of that it has. And so all of these new shoots come out, 
and all of these great green leaves that make it pretty, but harder for birds and whatnot to get to the seeds, are there so that they can mature and that they can produce further. But if we want the fruit of them, we have to trim away all of that other stuff because the natural of what a grapevine wants to do is to produce things, the leaves, the shoots, that don't produce any value to the plant itself. Matter of fact, what they do is they take the nutrients away from the fruit and so the fruit doesn't grow as large or as plentiful because it is spending all of its energy on other things. Pause. I think in our lives, it is very easy to see how we chase our careers We chase our our busyness of family life and things going on in in those directions. We chase the social aspect of our lives, and we chase all of these things that may not be producing the fruit that we really need to be producing in our lives. And we, we, we buy into the lie that that's just the natural of who we are. But even as I point out that that's how a grapevine will will live by itself, understand that God created the grapevine in the Garden of Eden with all of the other creation, and he created Adam. And and what is the first commandment he gives to Adam? He says, take care of this that I've entrusted to you, the garden. He intended from the beginning that Adam would be a gardener, that he would take care of the plants, and that he would prune and allow them to grow to their fullest potentials because guess what? Even as the grapevine will go a certain direction on its own, when properly cared for, it produces an amazing produce of fruit because God has intended that it would do so. And in our own lives, when we are left to our own devices, we will produce all kinds of shoots and off growth and, and flowery things that look a certain way. But if we allow the true vine to feed us and if we allow the true gardener to trim us, then we can produce something far more great. Grapevines must be pruned radically, not just a little bit, but radically. Uh, there's a picture I'm going to ask Sean to put on the screen in just a minute. This picture is of a grapevine that is actually an older grapevine in Israel. And this grapevine is, the, the picture you're seeing or we're about to see, is actually in the winter, and it's after the grapevine has produced all of its foliage and it's produced all of its grapes, and it's produced all of its, its season of, of, of usefulness. And now this picture is when the vine dresser has come back to the grapevine, and he has cut away everything. That actually is a very healthy grapevine. We look at it, and we see no leaves. We look at it, and we see just dead tree, it would look like. It would be a nuisance to have that in your backyard and have to mow around it. It it doesn't have any aesthetic value in this stage. It doesn't have any uh, production value in this stage. But the vine dresser, he does this and he bears it, uh, he trims it so far back because every year that he does this and trims away the the excess of what what is distracting to the plant, then what he finds is in the spring and throughout the summer, that vine will produce amazing results. Amazing results. Branches with no fruit must be removed so that they don't draw nutrients from the grapes. And and the the trimming has to be radical. And all of the fruitful branches, not just the ones that aren't producing fruit, but even the fruitful branches must be pruned back to produce even more fruit the following year. Because here's the truth about grapes. Are you ready for this? That grapevine will produce no grapes along its main pieces you see there. Grape vines only produce grapes on new growth. So you trim back what was to make room for what will be. Jesus, he turns to his disciples as they're walking through this this grapevine, and he talks to them about the fact that he is about to be arrested, he's about to be crucified, he's about to be killed for our sins. Um, But he, he, even in teaching all of this, he starts to teach them about serving one another And he starts to teach them about loving one another. And he starts to recalibrate in their eyes what is truly important. It's not about taking over the government and leading from from the top down in a a governmental structure. But rather, Jesus is saying it's all about serving those around you and treating other people the way that God would want them to be treated. And all of this stuff, he is pruning back their ideals of what the world should look like to what the world looks like through God's eyes. And in your life and in the life of the disciples, he has the same statement to you and I. And that statement is very simply this. He wants us to bear fruit. Fruit that matters. And so 
He'll trim back that which is in the way of producing that great fruit in our life. He will, he will trim it back and sometimes he'll even have to cut off some branches of our lives to remove that distraction or that thing that is taking away our nutrients and, and our desire to serve and honor him and to be a, a channel in which God's grace can flow. And so in this passage of scripture that we read in John chapter 15, we see Jesus giving us this illustration and his statement is, I am the vine. He is this main root of the branch here that, that is there and we need to understand that as the shoots of that vine producing fruit, we need to be tapped into who he is. If we're not tapped into who he is, then we will not bear fruit. And so let's take a look at that for a moment. He wants us to bear fruit. And so the first thing that he does, and keep this image up there throughout the rest of the message, if that's okay, Sean. What he does is first he lifts us up. A grapevines in and of themselves will creep along the ground. And so when you plant a new grapevine, you need to plant it next to a trellis of some sort, some kind of arbor that will hold it up. In this, in this situation, you see the grapevine itself, but you see this huge post in the middle and all of these vertical, or the vertical posts and the horizontal wires that are holding the branches up because a grapevine on its own will hug the ground. It will fall down on its own every single time. And, and the reason uh, that that's a bad thing if you're wanting to produce fruit is because you need the fruit up where it can get the sun and where it can have room to grow and to expand and to take on new and great things, right? Fruit takes on new and great things. No, I'm talking about us. Christ lifts us up because when we are down in the humanness of who we are, we, we find ourselves lacking. But when he lifts us up into the image of who he is, then he can do a great and awesome work in us. I find it interesting that Jesus, <clears throat> back in, you know, in 2,000 years ago, he uses this illustration of a vineyard. And for us here in America today, we don't understand that culture unless we have a vineyard near us. But the truth, and I find this very interesting, is that when a vine is trimmed back to its barest to make it healthy for the next year, it's trimmed into the shape of a cross. Did you notice that? I find that incredibly interesting, almost ironic, but yet it is the natural way that a vine is to grow its best fruit is to look like the cross. And so Jesus, he wants us to understand that if we are to bear fruit in the world around us, that we need to allow him to lift us up out of the mire of our sin, out of the condition in which we naturally want to live, in our selfishness, in our own desires, in our own wants, in our own ways. We need to be recalibrated, to be lifted up so that he can produce in us great fruit. Not grapefruit, great fruit. We need to be uh, willing to allow Christ to trim back as he lifts us up, to stretch out our our, our branches into the image of the cross. It's it's almost ironic as we look at this because in in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus himself says to his disciples, if anyone would want to come after me, if anyone would want to follow me, if anyone would want to call themselves a Christian, in other words, then they must daily deny themselves and take up a cross and follow me. And he's saying this to his disciples who have not yet seen Christ himself hanging on a cross. He's saying this to his disciples who just see that as a normal mode of execution. But I'm betting that they could look all around the world around them and see the image of the cross and understand, especially after Christ went to the cross, they would be reminded as they see this image that God wants to do a great work as he lifts us up. It's not about you becoming a better person. It's about Christ in you, lifting you up out of the mire of sin, out of the darkness of our depravity of humanity, out of the the guilt that we so readily uh, take on ourselves and out out of the shame and regret that we have for the things that we've done. All of those things, Christ wants to lift us up out of that and fashion us into the shape of a cross so that we can bear fruit. But not only does he want to lift us up, he also needs, and I've alluded to this several times, but he needs to prune within us that which takes away from that which he wants to produce. He needs to be able to prune within us. And and what's interesting about it is is that uh, even the branches that produce grapes need to be pruned back so that they can produce more grapes and larger grapes. And in our lives, many times we start to look at the production of grapes, the things in our lives that we do well, and we claim or we, we claim that we are, we are successful because there are grapes on this vine. 
but they're like the vine, the grapes in my backyard. They're, they're, they're grapes that aren't really that good because there's no meat in them. They're all seed because they've not been pruned back. And so we look at it and we say, oh, we have grapes, we're good to go. But God wants us to understand that what he really wants is fruit, not just the image of grapes. He doesn't want you to just say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm good to go. He wants you to be able to allow him to prune back that which is not made in his image, that which takes away from the production of grapes in your life. He wants to be able to to reach into our lives and to cut away the attitudes and the actions that so oftentimes are in conflict and take away the nutrients of the greatness of relationship with him. So with that comes a few things. One, what is it that you love the most in this world? What is it that you love the most in this world? Is it Christ? I mean, no, we, we're at church, so that's the right answer. It's Christ. I love Christ the most in this world. Well, do we live our lives reflecting that? Or are we much more interested in showing our love for our career? Are we much more interested in showing our love for our family? Now, career and family are good things, don't get me wrong. But Christ needs to be able to prune away so that he is the most important. And so that our family and our career and and any other thing that you put in the way of that comes secondary to him, that he can own that part of your life as well. Because even in those areas, he wants to produce fruit. Now, if we were to be able to zoom back out on this picture, and there are other pictures that do it, but this picture does not. If we were able to zoom back out, the idea is as the vine gets older and older and older, it extends down the the horizontal lines further and further out, producing more and more fruit the further out it goes. And so as we are allowing God to do the work in us and the pruning away, he takes away the things in our lives that get in the way of honoring him, but he also wants to stretch into other areas of our life and have his presence, his mark, his bearing of fruit in those locations as well. And so even as I said that we we need to not put our career first and love our career before him and our family first and love our family before him, understand that he wants to be a part of those things as well. But he wants to bear fruit in those locations and not just the image of fruit. He doesn't want you to be the Christian at work that claims his Christianity but turns people off to Christ. He wants you to be the Christian who loves others no matter what. He doesn't want you to be the Christian who in your community is known as the person who says one thing and does another. He wants you to be the Christian who is faithful and honoring to him and it's true to his word. So he needs to prune back sometimes. He needs to prune back those things that get in the way. Sometimes I marvel at when God is pruning because here's the thing. What I tend to do is the vine, and those vines can't do it, but what I as a human do is when he wants to start cutting, I flinch and then move away. And I'm like, I'm not sure I want you to prune that part of my life. I'm not sure I want you to prune that part of my heart uh, yet. I, I, am, I, I think I'm doing okay here. Don't you see the grapes? Don't you see that there's grapes here? Why would you cut there? And I fight against the idea that God wants to prune away. But if I would just trust him as, as, as the, the source of all things that are good, and if I would just rest in that knowledge, and, and I say all of this like it, like it makes sense, but I think each of us can understand that there are times in our lives when God wants to prune away from us that we're like, yeah, I'm not sure about that. But if we come to that spot, and when we come to that spot where we're like, okay, God, here you go. Go ahead, prune it away. As hard as that may sound and as much pain as it will be for you to prune off that branch, what we find is in the end, there is a greater produce of fruit. Because he lifts us up and he prunes with a purpose. He prunes with the purpose of producing greatness. Not greatness so you can pat yourself on the back or that others would look at you and say how great is that person, but greatness in the fact that other people would see him in you. That they would see the fruit of the Spirit in you. That they would see the fruit of the true vine growing in you. But not only does he lift us up, and not only does he prune us, but this passage of Scripture actually gets even stronger language in the second half of what we read, and it says that he also cuts off. 
And that's really weird to think about, but it's, it, one would say, well, that's the same thing as pruning. He's cutting off. But he actually cuts off branches, not just shoots sometimes, if they are dead. And there are attitudes in my life that if I am allowed to, to go onto my own devices, if and I don't surrender them to God, that they produce a death. It is not healthy for me or for those around me to allow that branch to remain. It takes away from the good fruit and it just saturates everything else and it makes it just wrong. And in the same way in a grape vine, there are times where a branch dies out and it is not doing any good at all. There are no fruit at all in that branch, not even the hint of fruit. And so it needs to be cut off and in this passage of Scripture, thrown into the fire. And in, a, in the same way in my life, there are things that sometimes God needs to be able to cut off. Now, he's a gentleman, God, and he won't do so without my permission. And so when I say, God created me a clean heart, he turns to me and says, are you sure you want that? Because here's what it means. This dead branch has to go. The dead branch of pride, for example. Pride produces nothing good in you. It is dead. There is no good fruit. Let me cut it away so that you can grow humility. Or he might look in my life and he might say, you know, you've got this critical spirit and it produces nothing good. Let me cut that away. It is dead. It is leading to death and destruction. Instead, let me grow in this area. If I can just cut that away, I can grow compassion for other people. And so we need to allow God to not only lift us up out of the sin and the darkness of who we are, and not only to prune back those things that he wants to grow in us greater, but also to cut off those things that are dead, that we keep putting nutrients into thinking that that's going to give us greatness, but yet it's just death. And we need to allow God to cut it off so that there can be actual greatness growing in that area. Because if we don't allow him to cut it off, then there is no room for his great grace. It is all about self. He wants us to bear fruit. And in this passage of scripture, he, he tells us that he wants to bear fruit in us. And then he tells us how. He tells us how. He says, I will lift you up. I will prune it away. I will cut it off. But then he continues and he says, I want not only to produce fruit in you, I want to remain in you, and I want you to remain in me. God does not want to leave us on our own devices and just let us grow into a gnarly vine of nothingness. He wants us to remain tied to the true vine, hooked into that source of life and energy that we would not try all of these things on our own abilities because guess what? Our own abilities fall so short every single time. The, the prophet says it in the Old Testament in, in Isaiah. He says, our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. And as gross as this sounds, if we actually get into the original Hebrew language, it is talking about a menstrual cloth. Uh, modern day translation, a tampon. And I know that you don't want to hear that from up here. But that's as pretty as our righteousness gets before God. That's the best we can do. That's not something that we want to go around bragging about. And as good as you can make yourself, it's not good enough to overcome sin. But with that reminder of how far our greatness gets us, there is this promise that God's greatness covers us. And, and his greatness goes the distance, and it, and it is enough, and it is beautiful before him when we surrender our lives to him and we remain in him. Verse 6 of this passage of Scripture says, If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Now that seems like a weird statement. And it doesn't mean that we can all be driving red Corvettes by next Sunday if we just ask God for it. Um, but what he is saying is if you allow him, the vine, to dwell in us, he recalibrates what we really need to be what is actually truly what we need instead of what we think we need. 
And he cuts off that which is in the way. And when we remain in him, the true greatness of who God is flows into our lives. And the book of Romans tells us that when we allow that to happen, we are never, ever on the disappointing end of that deal. That God always fulfills us. And that his, his greatness and his grace is greater than anything we could ever experience on our own devices. And so we need to allow him to cut off. We need him you know, to allow him to prune. We need to allow him to lift us up so that we can continue to remain in him, the true vine, from where our very strength comes from. We need to find ourselves in him. Because when we remain in him, and not of our own, we find that he that we, we can feed ourselves with God's word, his truth, and we can, we can feed ourselves with, with an active relationship with God in prayer and in trust and in conversation. That's what remaining in him looks like. It doesn't look like, hey, I'm going to go on my own and God just bless my life. It means that I'm, I'm relying on relationship with him to guide me and I'm allowing the spirit to live within me and show me truth into my life. And then when I'm doing those things, when I'm remaining in the presence of Christ himself, that's when he works amazing things out in my life of transformation and growth, in short, fruit. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica about this very idea about remaining in Christ. He doesn't use that word there. The same Greek word is not there about remaining. But he talks about our presence with Christ and, and what it should look like. It says that we should give thanks in all circumstances. It says that we should pray without ceasing. It says that we should never put out the Spirit's fire within us. And oh, by the way, in verse 23, it comes with this nice little caveat of, of, of promise. Don't worry if you don't feel like you can always be praying and giving thanks and never putting out the Spirit's fire because he who began the work in you is faithful and he will complete it. Meaning Christ. If we remain in relationship with him in constant attitude of prayer and, 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 and thankfulness and, and allowing the spirit to live in us, then he does this amazing work and he will bring it to completion, even when we can't grow it ourselves. The vine produces within us the fruit. The vine produces within us new growth that produces greatness. The vine stretches us out to reach into the world around us to produce fruit in those areas. It is the vine that produces all of it. It is not our abilities. It is not our, our self-discipline. It is not our talents, our gifts. It is Christ in us. That is the only way. And so, Father God, I thank you that we can, that we can come here and we can worship you and honor you with our life with our heart, with our mind, with our soul. But God, I thank you that you are the vine, the true vine. You are the, the source to which all of our strength comes from. You are our helper. Uh, and, and God, when we are so unable to do that which produces great fruit, you come in and you prune away that which is in the way, you cut off that which leads to death and destruction, and you lift us up so that you can produce greatness. And so, God, I want to, I want to submit to that. I want to become that vine that you can trim away and do whatever you will with because I know that you're going to produce something awesome. So help me to trust in you when you cut. Help me to allow you to lift me up and not try to lift myself up. And God, help me to just remain connected to the vine, where the source, where the strength comes from. And I pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.